Now, please welcome George Fisher Wilson, business development manager with 3D Hubs. 3D printing you, is Thank disrupting you. the way we make things. The technology is rapidly changing, and so are its capabilities. George will navigate us through the latest innovations and real-world use cases of this revolutionary technology, 3D printing. Hello, everyone. Um, today I'll be talking about 3D printing, but let me start by explaining a little bit about who we are at 3D Hubs. So 3D Hubs was founded three years ago by these two gentlemen up oh, there on here, um, uh, two former employees of 3D Systems who uh, set about creating a company to fill a growing market and growing void that was appearing. Desktop 3D printing, around three years ago, we saw a huge increase in home ownership. Machines were able to produce uh, amazing parts at similar quality to the high-end machines. This created a huge opportunity. There was around 200,000 3D printers all around the globe sitting at 95% idle capacity. It's a great technology that should be utilized more, and this was the birth of 3D Hubs, a platform that allows people to access local 3D printers, big or small, um, and the emphasis on the way it works is very simple. People upload a 3D design, an STL, they choose a print location, and they pick up their product or get it shipped. As a platform, we currently now cover 25,000 3D printing locations all around the globe. We're active in more countries than McDonald's and provide 3D printing services to around a billion people within 10 miles of their home. But that's all great. But the real reason I'm here is because there's been quite a lot of negative press at the moment around 3D printing. We're hearing things like 3D printing is a fad, 3D printing is dead, there's no future in 3D printing. And it seems to all really center around the idea that 3D printing, especially consumer 3D printing, hasn't really met our expectations. And looking at Gartner's hype cycle, we can kind of see, um, well, it's kind of easy to guess why this has been happening. You can see as technology enters the market, we all rave and shout about it. People then kind of get disinterested as it doesn't meet those expectations, and then re-adoption begins, and the real innovation starts. And 3D printing hit a similar route. So it shot all the way up to the peak of inflated expectations. And during that process, we thought we'd all be living in 3D printed houses, just like this concrete one here eating 3D printed food, just like this, uh, sh these sugar crystal structures here made by 3D systems, and driving 3D printed cars, just like this one here by local motors. And now we're heading to the, the trough of disillusionment. We're all kind of losing our minds that 3D printing is not what we expected, and we're all sat around asking the question, where did it all go wrong? Well, I'm here today to talk about enterprise 3D printing. The 3D printing that not everyone is talking about, but really should be shouted about. This is where the real benefits of 3D printing are happening. And as you can see here, it's just entering its plateau of productivity. First off, I'll be discussing some success stories. Here you see the Ford Mustang 2016, a beautiful car and uh, one that's been heavily built around prototyping and 3D printing. Here you'll see its engine cover. Its engine cover was created for $4,000 and only took four days. This was a process that previously would have taken six months and half a million dollars. But thanks to modern 3D printing techniques, it's something that saves time and saves money. Here you can see the, the, the engine cover itself being lifted from the print bed. It's a powder printer. Next up is Airbus. So Airbus, when they were um, looking at ways to innovate with the new creation of their A350 XWB, I believe, they really wanted uh, ways to innovate, and they wanted ways to kind of make the plane different to all the others. So they turned to metal 3D printing. They were able to create 1,000 titanium 3D printed parts for their new plane that actually sit in that plane today. They were able to save up to 55% in weight for some parts in the plane. 
And for every kilo they save, 4,000 euros is saved in fuel. Next up, drone companies. It's no surprise that drone companies have risen alongside the industry of 3D printing. We work with a lot of drone companies at 3D Hubs, and they all have one thing in common. It's that they crash a lot. And with 3D printing, a drone can go from looking like this, to this, to this, in a matter of days. And it's not just about the new iteration speeds, but it's about the innovation speeds. And that's what 3D printing really offers this industry. Next up is a slightly more obscure example. Um, it's a company called Mac Goods. They're a company we saw on our platform, and they create these beautiful wall art installations. And I'm not sure whether you'll be able to see here, but the connectors uh, are the small white pieces here. They were able to do a short series run of production, which enabled them to bring their product to market in just under two weeks at a cost of $1, a couple of thousand dollars, which normally would have meant kind of weeks of tooling, weeks of waiting on molding, and then no feedback from the product once it's done. 3D printing really allowed them to uh, bring their product super fast to market, gain valuable feedback, and then when they saw demand, they can then go on to these more expensive ways of manufacturing, such as injection molding. And as a final example, this is another company we saw on recently on the platform, uh, a company called Shift Labs. They make brilliant and innovative and affordable uh, uh, healthcare um, products. The healthcare product here you can see is Drip Assist. Drip Assist allows medical professionals to track drips ex exceptionally easily. Instead of kind of like standing there, holding the bag, counting it all out, something that creates a lot of errors and create, can in some cases jeopardize people's safety. They were able to kind of take their product from a really rudimentary uh, visual aid, such as the one you can see here, and they were able to use the range of materials now available with modern 3D printing to take it all the way up to right before manufacturing to test form, fit, and function. And that's really what 3D printing offers. It offers a way for you to not only to kind of check visually how your product looks, but really take it to that next level and see right before you want to do mass manufacturing what your product will look like and how it will feel. Um, and I think that during these kind of success stories I've showed, there's kind of two really key things that 3D printing does. It saves you time and it saves you money, which are two hard commodities to come by, especially with bigger businesses. Now I've highlighted some of these success stories, I think it's important to look at what we have to come uh, and what will be coming this year in 2016. Technologies to get excited about within 3D printing. First up is a printer called Mark Forged. It's a printer that has two extruding nozzles, one which lays down the material and one which reinforces it with composite fibers. This printer allows you to 3D print with the strength of aluminium at the cost of plastic. And you can print in materials such as Kevlar, carbon fiber, and fiberglass. So it's really a revolutionary printer. Next up is uh, Sintratech. So Sintratech, uh, last year, and they'll be shipping their products this year, released a 3D printer that uses a technology called SLS, Selective Laser Sintering. This was always a technology that had only ever been available with high-end printers costing upwards of 200,000 euros, 500,000 euros, and thanks to patents expiring, they were able to take that technology, kind of box it up in a smaller package, and make it more accessible to the masses with a really kind of low-cost entry point. This printer especially allows you to print with such complex geometries, kind of seen uh, previously in, in my slide with the Airbus, where you've got like all these interchanging geometries at different heights, things that modern manufacturing really wouldn't be able to deal with. Next up is a personal favorite of mine, it's Carbon 3D. They'll be launching this year at four uh, service bureaus. They have um, a really amazing technology called Clip. And what that does is it allows you to continuously cure a resin from a bath, and it will literally pull the object out of the bath. It's uh, one of the more exciting technologies out there, uh, and we hear a lot of people talking about it in relation to the, the Terminator movies. But uh, in terms of speed, it can print up to 50 times faster than some modern desktop printers, which means engineers now can not only kind of think of an idea and wait a day to see it, they can think of an idea and wait an hour and see it, which is huge. Next up is Vauxhall 8. This should be playing a video, but we seem to be experiencing some minor te technical difficulties. Um, but this printer here prints with two nozzles similar to the Mark Forge printer. Uh, one of those nozzles has a conductive ink, the other prints in plastic. 
And this means that you can print functional electronic prototypes in the office or at home, and really takes that prototyping to another level where you see your prototype come alive. And then, last but not least, uh, desktop metal. This is probably one not for this year. It's probably one more for kind of towards the end of this year, early next year. Uh, they recently got $12 million of funding to bring metal 3D printing to the desktop. It's, uh, metal 3D printing has always been uh, a really interesting field, something that's continually seeing kind of super fast innovations taking place. And the idea that you can then bring this technology, which has always been super expensive to the majority of people, and something kind of only exclusively used with multinationals and huge engineering firms, you can now, well, potentially at the end of this year or the start of next year, bring that technology to the desktop, making it accessible to all kinds of communities, and really utilizing the power of those communities to see how that technology can be used in the best ways. And then, finally, for 3D hubs. So, as a platform, the most important thing for us is making all of these technologies accessible. It's all good and well having uh, the Carbon 3D Superfast 3D printer. It's all good and well having the Desktop Metal 3D printer. But if these 3D printers aren't accessible to the masses, then we really won't see the capabilities of them. Um, and so with that said, we're now going to be looking to expand our industrial 3D printing services that we currently provide. Uh, we currently have around 500 different high-end machines ranging from full color to metal to SLS. And so, yeah, really our next goal is to bring all this technology to all the people around the world. And, uh, and that concludes the presentation. <laughs> Thank you very much. I may have finished a little. What early. would you like to know? I'm so glad you're here. Would you please <laughs> would you would you please say that I did not pay you? You didn't pay me. We never <laughs> met. <laughs> uh, hi. Did I get it right? This is like a Uber for 3D printers. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. So Excellent. that's what we've actually been, been called in the past. Right. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's a distributive network of 3D printers where people can really um, gain access through our platform. And on the, up the other side of that, people can upload their 3D printers, big, big or small, as I said, um, to give access to the local community and even people from far away uh, to utilize this great technology. You work with uh, home-based 3D printers also, or just industrial? Uh, Predominantly, we have like a well, actually we have a very diverse mix, but we have home-based like desktop machines that people use for very kind of rudimentary prototyping, visual aids. But then we also have the metal 3D printers that I explained are kind of really high-end as well. So a real diverse mix, which is kind of plays into the benefits of the platform, where we have companies like Shift Labs that will come get a $20 visual aid prototype and then be able to go away, find a guy 10 kilometers away and then really see uh, a polyjet high-end sort of SLS print, uh, which will really show them exactly how their product will look, all within the space of a week to two weeks, and all made within sort of 20 to 30 kilometers. And uh, is there like a rating scheme? Like if I'm happy with a certain printer, I can give my review? Um, so in two ways. So you can review your print, and that person will then get a score similar to eBay in that sense. Um, and then from the flip side of that, we do a, a buyer's guide, so we condense all the information from those 25,000 hubs. We get them to talk about their 3D printers and, and give really good feedback because, I mean, these communities are really passionate about their machines. And then we then put them into like what we call our buyer's guide so people can see uh, user-created content around their printer, what people are saying, whether they would recommend it, and just makes everything very transparent. Sounds great. Thank you. No problem. More questions? I like to. Do I understand right? A three D three D printer uses certain materials, so whatever comes out of the printer is as good as that material. Yeah, in some ways. So there's such a diverse range of materials. Is mo there? Mo the I thought it's all the same kind of plastic. No, no, no. So it's not. No, no, it's not. So you do have um, the kind of the desktop machines you probably see most in the, in the media, which kind of depict this like almost like an upside down tube of toothpaste spitting out plastic. Uh, mm -hmm. Those plastics are like PLA and ABS, which are quite common, and ABS used in most kind of uh, 
and manufactured parts as well in the house. Um, but you also see uh, composites. So you can 3D print in wood. So it'll be 80% wood fibers, 20% plastic. You can also print in bronze. You can also print in carbon fiber. And with the machines I showed towards the end, you can, you can print in resins. You can print in conductive uh, plastics. You can print in metals. I could keep going, to be honest. I'll probably, I you should stop keep now. Going. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, there is okay. a really diverse range. And that's one of the great benefits of 3D printing as a technology is that if you think of something and you want it realized, you can realize that idea in so many different ways. OK. Now, I have a dream. I, I walk in shoes with a certain inlay sole. <laughs> I need those inlay soles in a, in a certain shape. And uh, it's always so tiring to go to a place, have it done, and, and produce. I'd, I'd have that at home just for those soles. Can a 3D printer produce a material that is not totally stiff, but also a little elastic? Yeah, so... Like a sole you would walk on? So, yeah, so the, the, it's really funny you said that. There are actually like two to three companies already out there. I think one of them is called Soles, S O. LS, another one I think spelt W I I V, and uh, they've had one of them had super successful Kickstarter campaign. I think they raised over like a million dollars, and the whole idea is you take a picture of your foot, and then that picture becomes the sole of well your custom made sole, which then you can inlay into your shoes. And their target market are people like chefs, for instance, they're on their feet all day, and even like um, hikers that really. Uh, diverse mix of customers that are interested in that. So yeah, there's a company out there for you already. S-O-L-S. S-O-L-S, I believe, yeah. Um, That's what Seabit is good for. <laughs> yeah, so now your feet will be forever comfortable <laughs> thanks to this talk. Yeah, I'll walk better. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Okay, who of you can, yes please. Um, it seems to be very useful if you um, can combine it with 3D scanning, but I don't have any idea how far that technology is for the consumer market. Okay, yeah, so 3D scanning, um, in terms of the technology itself and how far it's come, it's come a long way. I mean, you can scan, uh, there's all kinds of scanners out there. You have scanners that can scan like a whole body, like the selfies you've probably seen in the media a lot. But then you also have the really high-end uh, scanners that can scan objects as big as cars to the quality of like a, a hair strand, basically. Um, and we've seen like a big movement now with people scanning old objects to keep them. So like um, they'll go into museums and scan all the objects. So we have a digital uh, museum as well as a physical museum. And then also we saw um, there was a, a group of guys who were archaeologists that went to um, Syria and they took scans of um, buildings and, and so on that have been demolished by ISIS. And then they were able to recreate them in the digital form and then 3D print them. So 3D scanning has come so far now that, in a sense, it's keeping some things alive that otherwise would have disappeared. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you. No problem. What are the most commercial um, uses of, of, or the most popular uses of 3D printing? Uh, Till now, we, we, I work in a, co in a, in a, in a, in a, in a co-working space. For some time, we had a 3D printer there, Just someone's toy. Everyone gathered around, had a look at it, and we had demonstrations. But then after a while, you, you walk back and say, well, everything, everything I need, I, you know, I order by Amazon, and it's already done. Yeah. So why bother printing something? Who bothers printing stuff? I think it's a really interesting point. I think, in some ways, Amazon now could potentially be the biggest rival to 3D printing, in the sense that the main benefit of 3D printing is it realizes a physical object in a matter of hours. And I mean, with the super fast deliveries that Amazon do, you're also realizing an object in a matter of well, 24 hours. I can understand that an architect does a 3D model of a house. Yeah. And then a few hours later, he has a plastic model or a wood plastic model on the table uh, to impress the customer. That makes sense. So that is you know, a unique thing for a B2B purpose. Yeah. And never mind the price. If, the, if it's good enough, it can have a good price. I, th I think the, 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 <coughs> biz, the, the B2B side and the business side of 3D printing has been around for many years, and it's always been prototyping. Um, the consumer side really still has around three to five years to get there before we really see mass adoption. Um, but one of the things we see from a lot of our community who are very talented makers are that um, if something breaks in their home, they'll model it and they'll 3D print it. So for instance, um, my uh, nightstand for my phone recently broke. So instead of buying another one from Amazon, which would then be shipped from China to their depot and then sent out, 
and it would have taken, I don't know, like two days. I was able to send an order to a local hub that lived less than a mile away from me, and I got that dock 3D printed, that nightstand, sorry, and that was done in, in three hours, and it was done locally to me without the need for a warehouse to keep stock, uh, without the concerns of overproduction, and most importantly, without any environmental concerns as well. It's really on-demand manufacturing. Can you 3D print body parcels? Like, I might need a new, knee, uh, um, need a new knee sometime, or I might need a new hip sometime. You know, I, I could scan my body now, this is what it's supposed to look like, what do we call them, all the teeth and everything. Have that in a data bank and then whenever I break something, have right that teeth on my printer. I think, I think that Go one day maybe... Go to the dentist may be, and say, <laughs> implant that one. I think one day maybe, but the medical applications and the medical implications of 3D printing are so huge. I mean, we're seeing people now 3D print um, spinal columns that they're putting inside of humans there, we've, we're seeing um, a big movement fr from a group called Enable, who 3D print uh, prosthetic hands uh, mm -hmm. really affordably. We would actually did a trial with them where we reached out to our uh, hubs in New York and, and Washington. You mean the bones of the hand, not the entire hand? You no, so they print 3D a plastic print a plastic, plastic prosthesis, yeah. Okay. Um, and um, in terms of like the bioprinting, that's a whole nother, a whole nother story in a mm -hmm. sense that people are printing ears and so on now. But using the network, they were able to 3D print 26 of these prosthetics, which were then assembled in schools to teach them about engineering, and then taken to Haiti and, and matched with people that couldn't otherwise um, afford prosthetics or have access to them. So there really is so many medical benefits to 3D printing. But maybe one day uh, we will see a 3D scan of yourself, you lose an arm, and then you go away and bioprint a new one. But yeah. it's probably a bit far down the line. <laughs> okay, well. Just wait for the next seabed and it's closer than you think. <laughs> <laughs> Someone will come up with his own skeleton. I 3D printed that. It's me. Just in case I need it or a part of it. <laughs> Any more questions? Fantasize. Imagine. Think of a use. Uh, you mentioned and, uh, that you were going to expand your, your business to more than you were 500, as I understood. 500 locations, more or less, and you want to expand. But since you mentioned that you're actually just a hub, so how, how would the expansion work? Like, I mean, other areas, other countries? So, so um, the, the actual platform itself contains now, I think to this, the numbers are right, around 28,000 of these hubs. So 28,000 um, 3D printer owners, 3D printing services that are signed up to the platform. Um, and in terms of the uh, expansion, um, with the high-end 3D printing, industrial 3D printing, what we've done is launch a service called HD. So just to try and really clarify the difference between kind of the higher-end 3D printing services and the more affordable 3D printing services. Um, and what that does is it means that um, higher-end industrial 3D printing bureaus can look to our platform to supplement their own current income and own current orders. And in some cases, our... Um, customer base can overlap their current customer base. So it really is a win-win situation. It's a bit of a cliche to say. I mean, if you're someone that owns an uh, industrial 3D printing uh, service, why wouldn't you sign up to a platform that can potentially provide you customers at no cost to you? So yeah, that's, that's, in a sense, that's the, that's the pitch. And, and so far, it's been working OK. <laughs> More details you'd like to know for your business. He is extremely expensive when you hire him. Today he's for free. You already paid the ticket. Yeah, another one. Yeah, go. <laughs> We're here. We're do, here do, for that. Do you have an app? Do we have an app? Uh, we do not currently have an app. Um, we are currently only uh, web-based, um, but we have had one of our designers um, put together like a mock-up of what potentially that might look like. Um, but at the moment, we see most of our traffic actually coming from, uh, from web just because um, if you're a product designer or an engineer, you tend to model on your web browser or on your software, and then you go straight onto your um, browser and connect to 3D hubs. On mobile, like uh, downloading and holding an STL file and then submitting it, it feel, can feel quite clunky. So at the moment, it's not something that we've really looked into. No, I mean for the consumer market or the low-end market. Oh, OK. Um, so we have actually partnered with a company called Autodesk, uh, one of the largest software providers. Um, they have an app called Tinkerplay. Um, which allows uh, young children to create um, 
toys, basically. Um, I don't know if you saw the recent press release by Mattel, who released the Thing Maker, which was a 3D printer. They both use the same application. So you can basically custom design your own toy. And then we have uh, built into the app our API, which someone clicks on. Then they send that to one of our service providers, and that all goes through there. That's the closest thing at the moment we have. OK, thank you. So if you need a 3D printer, just ask your son. He probably has one by Mattel. P potentially, yeah, by the end of the year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Thank you very much, George. This was an absolutely impressive presentation. Thank you. Just another game changer. We didn't have that many disruptive technologies and game changers this time, but we had a few that were really impressive. And I wish you all the best for your business. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you for you listening. Thank you very much. Bye bye.